Oh, I thought voice commands broke again. Hey, everybody. Hey, Bobby. Hey, Blue Monster. Hey, Casey. It is Monday. We are going to do a few things. <clears throat> a few different things. Actually, one of the same and then two different things, maybe. Adam is going to start by reviewing his... Oh, wait. Didn't I make a, a tenets thing or something? Ah, there it is. Ha, 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 ha. Adam is reviewing his tenets. This process takes place every week. I'll update this command when the review is done. Nice. Nice indeed. Hey, Bakari Dev. Hey, Packer. All right. So let's kick this off. Um, this is what we're going to start with is a tenant review. And then I'm going to move on to some video research that I wanted to do, which is really just learning content. It might take half an hour. It might take 45 minutes. I don't know. It's not going to take like three hours probably. And then I want to get through the code reviews that people submitted. For those who haven't seen this yet, there is the code review command, which has a link to a form. The form is how you would sign up to be on that segment of the show, which when I do this, do this, I should mention the code review command. Yeah, and this should just be pumped to Wednesday. So the corn keyboard has arrived and right now it's like I've had an operation on both wrists and learning to write again. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty normal, but I hope you like it. H me go. Hey, yo. All right, it's tenets. So let's open this up over here and this up over here and go through the review. Tenant review. So breaks got a little bit sloppy over the last week, especially on Friday when I was just chatting about content creation. I didn't take a break for like two hours. You do love it. Yeah. Well, I hope you continue to. Um, because one of the difficult things about, oh, noob, thanks for resubbing. Uh, one of the difficult things about the learning curve is that the thing that got you to learn is usually exciting. And then you hit the curve part of the learning curve. <laughs> and then that can be a little bit demotivating. Need to get some angle to them. What I used originally, and I don't, you might've seen this actually was just a couple of game cases in between the two keyboards that way I could get some, whatever, I guess, vertical tenting. I don't angle them toward me like this, but you could do that too, of course. You just put something on the back of it. Your body just needed a break from all the breaks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, on Friday. <laughs> That's a good way to look at this. <laughs> um, I don't really think this is a problem, though. I don't think there's a, a big problem here, though. I think that generally I've been I've been taking breaks for at least as long as Jump Royale. All right, mix it up. This is this is happening. <laughs> Today is a good example and that I'm trying some video research and code reviews. Light on post stream to do's. Uh, still honestly not great. Now, in fact, I think I should rework this. I keep talking about how I don't want to be putting a bunch of tasks on this list. I don't really think putting the tasks on the list is a big problem. I think the real problem is carving out time to do this. Maybe, I don't know. You can kind of see both as being the problem. I think, hmm. I think I need to keep an eye on this. Still not sure how I feel about this. I will probably always generate tasks for after the stream. And I just need to make sure I'm carving out time to do them. Ideally, that time happens during work hours. Yeah. Problem is I never learned to touch type. Well, you're definitely going to learn it now. <laughs> Would adding an automated command to the bot be a good idea? Like one hour from the start, it pings you with break or something. I'd originally thought about doing that, but I like the flexibility. And I suppose you could still have flexibility. Something that uh, Toulouse does in his stream is he has a break command, but then he has a way of delaying the break. And he can only delay it so long before his bot just shuts down the stream. No, I'm kidding. It doesn't shut down the stream, but before he has to take a break. It would you just say to me. <laughs> People asking for advice on learning something, I always tell them to build something they find fun, interesting, exciting. Helps with the learning process. Yeah, I think so too. And I think eventually you hit the point where it's just hard work. 
and I, oh, hang on a second. Addy, 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 that's what this is for. Yeah. She's, she's scratching at the chair. I wanted to get her a scratch at the scratching pad. Good girl. Yeah. You're a good cat. Okay. Whew. All right. Well, I want to keep an eye on this. I don't exactly know what I want to do. Wiggy, thank you, too, for seven. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Sam. Okay, MVP rules the land. Did we have a chance to do this? Let's see what happened last week. It was all of this. So we worked on the bot pretty heavily. It was YouTube stuff. Some co-working, some chatting, some mentoring. Uh, so what happened with the YouTube stuff? I think... I think the YouTube stuff that I did is a good example. I couldn't find an existing library that I was allowed to use. So I made just what I needed and refactored what I needed. Yeah, unfortunately, I never finished writing that code. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's not actually running right now, and I'll need to do that. In fact, you know what? I wonder if this is a good example. Maybe we should try it. Maybe I should try running it today and just see how much it uses of the quota that I have. I kind of want to do that, but it's going to be a fake database. All right, you know what? Let's do that. Code, Abbott packages, bots, and PMPM start. Okay, I want to keep track of when I start this. So let me write this over here. Starting the YouTube bot. Want to see how much quota it uses. Okay. Okay, cool. So it's already sent a message. I have not touched this at all today. So it must have been a zero quota to begin with. And we'll just edit the today command the same way that I had done over here. Oh my god, are you kidding me? Minus 137? You can't send messages that are longer than 200 characters. Oh my god. I did not know this about YouTube. I just assumed you would have at least 500 characters. Oh man, what a what a stupid thing. I mean, I guess it makes sense, but oh, fine. That's why this is all gray. Yeah, I guess we'll just do that. Oh, crows. That's a ton of gifted subs. <laughs> Thank you very much. And welcome all you new subs. I think I only recognize three of those names. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Crows. All right, so I've started the bot. We're going to take a look at this sometime later today and see how much it's used. In fact, maybe by the end of the morning stream. But I guess let's continue with this. So mentality, sustainability. I think this has been fine. Yeah, I think that evolving the stream content will also keep things interesting. Okay, uh, boring activities. I, I don't even think this should be a tenant anymore. I don't think this should be a tenant anymore. It's not really steering my decisions. And I've clearly done boring stuff on stream. Yeah, all right, so let's delete this. This was the entire point to cut down to the tenants that actually matter. Retired on. And rationale is I have a pretty much what I just wrote here. Yeah. It's not really steering my decisions anymore. And I think the stream content will evolve anyway to the point where I don't hold this near and dear to the stream. Hey, Goose. Plus, I've done boring stuff pretty much every week. Okay, cool. Next up, embrace failure. Uh, what 
did I do last week that might have been about embracing failure? I'm not happy with the co-working streams. And, you know, I really appreciated Caleb's message in last stream. Where was it? Yeah, anyway, the whole, I, you just go do something. <laughs> um, so I still look at co-working as, oh, hey, check this out. Uh, Visual Studio Code just added a new feature. You can now press Command, Alt, and V to enter dictation mode. And now everything that you say is going to be typed into the buffer. We've done it. We've moved past keyboards. Oh, and apparently you can press enter on the keyboard and then just continue speaking. Wow. Yeah. Um, anyway, <laughs> this was, this is not what I wanted to say. The thing I wanted to say about coworking is for me, I get stuff done for viewers. I think it's like ultra boring. And maybe keyboard sounds will help a bit, but mostly I'm leaning toward doing one more, seeing how that goes, then maybe moving the whole thing to Discord. Yeah. Hey, Lemon. Time to retire all those layers you memorize on your coin. <laughs> yeah, time to just say everything. <laughs> Wonder how that dictation thing is going to butcher my broken English. It can apparently listen in multiple languages. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know how good this is going to be for code, to be honest, but I don't really think it needs to be. I think just having dictation software is pretty good. So like, let's say we were in, I don't know, JavaScript. Let's just see what it would do. Function sum parenthesis X comma Y. No, yeah, it's not for, it's not for syntax. Okay. Yeah. And that's fine. Like I said, I don't think it needs to be. I think it's for writing out documentation or comments or just your thought process, a to-do item, or even the things that I do here. As I'm speaking, I could just have it dictated all, and that way anyone who's just coming in could still see what it is that I've said. Yeah, that alone, I think, can be pretty interesting. Okay, embrace failure. Uh, definitely happening. Keeping an eye on co-working and how I feel about it. Community, we took strides here and things are progressing and celebrate the successes. Do you know what I realized? I realized that when I look at the successes, I look back at the last week, but you know what's missing from this week? There's a gap between Monday and Wednesday where I make YouTube videos. I never celebrate those successes. And this last week I made a video about the corn and I, I mean, it's done okay. Like, yeah. Um, it's kind of an interesting thing that I noticed about YouTube. So I made videos on the mini PC, the corn, obsidian, OneNote, and some other things. Anyway, uh, these in terms of like, I think it was like three new subs for this, three new subs for this, and then like more than three and more than three. And I think these videos that I do on like, hey, here's a thing that I use or that I've made is different from here's a thing you probably already use. So these are more esoteric products and these are not, right? People use note taking software. They don't use mini keyboards and mini PC, whatever. So interesting. We've learned almost nothing. <laughs> it's that if a video is relatable, people are going to subscribe to it. <laughs> Yeah, if it does work, no thing will be a breeze. Yeah, and then I think I wonder if I'll still type out what I'm saying. How did the VS Code extensions video do on that? It's a good question. Let's go find out. Because I guess that's a little of both, where it's like, hey, here's something that I'm using, but that might help you. How do I videos? I think videos alone should have been enough to search for this and not find live streams. Yeah, there we go. Okay, video code extensions. This is not the analytics section. Oh man, hunting through this list for the thing I'm ever trying to find is so difficult. 
It's not harder than finding settings on Twitch. That's the hardest thing. But yeah, like, <laughs> where's, here it is, this one. Okay, how do you see how many subscriptions it got? Oh my God. I'm sure there's an easier way to do this. And if I only just knew where it was, I can see views, watch time, subscription status. I want to see new subscribers. Is this the thing? Okay, subscribers gained. I don't know if this is exactly what I'm what I want to see here. Also, how do I see yeah, since uploaded? Okay, nine. Yeah. It does work faster. Huh? <laughs> Have you made any video explaining your note-taking strategy and tools? No, so that's one of the things I should probably just make a command for this if I don't already have one. Organization. Yeah, no. All right, so ACOM organization. Adam is going to do uh, an entire course on note taking. On, yeah, organization, I guess I should say. Note taking, managing, reminders, and calendars. Um, what else is on this thing? Because I wrote a whole overview of it somewhere, but it's in my private notes. So let me see if I can go find it really fast. Priv, RGI organization. There it is. Okay. So what are the things I had? Tally, note taking, maintaining notes, to do lists, uh, calendars, there's meetings. And finding things. Okay. What is bind address research? There's a video I want to make tomorrow on bind addresses, and I just want to finish researching it today. Uh, he plans to start this in March and ideally release it in April. It will probably cost more than $50. There we go. Pop in most days and so always retrospective meta stuff. Is there a point where the stream transition to Adam learn stuff or is the Twitch mostly for internal meta things? Um, I think I, I don't know. I, you know, if I look at the last week, for example, how much of it was meta stuff and I, I get the sentiment about that, but or maybe what you're calling meta is not what I'm calling meta. But if we look at the last week, there were a lot of things that were done to the YouTube side of the bot. And I see that as just development. Now, I don't want to just be doing development all the time. But for example, the thing I had planned for this afternoon was going to be continuing with the Godot multiplayer stuff, um, which is just learning content, I suppose. I know last week was heavier on this because we had a co-working stream, two just kind of chatting streams. There was mentoring in there. But then the rest of it was like bot development, and I, that was more than half the time. I do want to be experimenting with this stuff and just kind of seeing where it goes. So, uh, yeah, I don't know what to say about the content branding for a little while. Anyway, yeah, so the reason I mentioned this stuff about the organization course is I will probably not do a free note-taking video. Oh, you bundled bot stuff in meta. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and the bot stuff should eventually come to mostly a close. Like I said, there'll be a feature here and there. But I think that in March, I want to explore some new things. I'm going to finally, at some point, set up interviews. I haven't done that yet. This Wednesday, we're going to do a one-off uh, advice session with Casey in chat. And so it'll be like a mentoring session, except that it will not be a series. It's just going to be one. So 
so anyway, I'm gonna still keep an eye on this stuff and I just, I'm gonna just try things out and we'll see how it goes. Anyway, celebrating the successes. So the reason I had this written down here and then I was talking about it is because um, I've been making YouTube videos, but haven't really been celebrating those. Either way, this last week, I feel like there was a lot of hard work on the YouTube API stuff. And I'm very happy with how it landed, even if it's not done. Okay, yeah, that's it. That's the tenant review. Um, so kind of general thoughts here. I think the the big thing, and I know I've talked about this a lot, but it's the stream evolution of like, what's the kind of content that I do? Um, how do people feel about it? And how do I feel about it? And that's what we're going to kind of explore a bit. So now I think I want to get to this whole research stuff. Did I figure out the API rate limit stuff? Um, I mean, there's nothing really to figure out so much. It's like there is a limit right now and I'll probably hit it within one stream and there's no easy way to work around it. And so I need to eventually just ask for a quota increase. I'm still doing 10, 10 second polling. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing that I could do around that is either break the terms of service, which I don't plan on doing or ask for a quota increase. That's it. That's literally the only two things you can do. There's, there's no other way to like, you have to use one request point per request at the very least. So you either do it less frequently or you uh, bypass it completely, which is a violation of the terms of service or you increase the quota. There's one tiny thing I could do, which is potentially cut down on fetching author information, but th that's, I don't think a major contributor to the number of quota points I'm using. Okay. So Adam wants to make a video on bind addresses tomorrow and just wants to make sure that he fully understands them. So he's doing some research now for them. Groovy, thank you for resubbing. That's very groovy of you. Okay, so there's that. And now can I fit this into YouTube? Yeah. All right, so let me go find my notes on this now. Because there's some stuff that I have RGIFF videos. Give me a sec. I'm still searching for this. There it is. Okay, now I'm going to cat this. Okay, here are the only notes that I have on this so far. I'll just paste them in here for right now. And it's not a lot. <laughs> this is why I want to do some research on this. So let's go write this into. Um, hmm. Do I have anything on zero, 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 zero? Not a dedicated note. Yeah, not a dedicated note. I've got some various things here like this. And I'm not sure where this should go. Let's see. I mean, MISC? No, this isn't. I, I think it should go in coding somewhere. I'm just not sure where. Maybe there should be like a general section. Yeah, like general networking knowledge. Eh, maybe it should go into here. All right, well, let's look up first. Bind address. I want to see if this is a general term. People call it different things. Cause like, okay, MySQL calls it bind address. And yeah, I want to, let's, let's just start there. Let's search for this. And I mean, this is the address that it will listen on, but you know, how many people call it bind address? What, what do people call it? Listen address. Is there a way to just find the documentation that talks about this? This is a blog post here. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Started with an appropriate bind address setting to permit it to accept IPv6 connections, for example, with the following line. So this maybe listens on one or more network sockets for TCP IP connections. Each socket is bound to one address, 
but it's possible for an address to map to multiple network interfaces to specify how the server should listen for connection set bind address at startup. Server also has admin address, see connection interfaces, list of comma separate values. Yeah, so I think this is kind of where I need to start writing some of this stuff down. Uh, do I have an infrastructure folder somewhere? Let's go find out. Notes, pub, fd, infra. No, all I have is the coding stuff, yeah. And if I search for general, no, nothing. Okay, well, let's make something in here then, I guess. Or actually, no, I just said general networking could be the thing. All right, so bind addresses. All right, section describes aspects of how, can I close this? Yeah, of how MySQL server manages client connections. All right, the page isn't too long. Server is capable of listening for client connections on multiple network interfaces. Connection manager threads handle client connection requests on the network interfaces that the server listens to. On all platforms, one manager thread handles TCP IP connection requests. On Unix, the same thread also handles socket file connection requests. On Windows, another thread handles shared memory connection requests and name pipes. And on all platforms, an additional network interface may be enabled to accept administrative TCP IP connections. Okay, this is not exactly what I was thinking about here. Server does not create threads to handle interfaces that it does not listen to. Yeah, individual server plugin. Okay, good. Connection manager threads associate each client connection with a thread dedicated to it that handles authentication and request processing. Hmm. No, this is not what I'm talking about here. You know what I think would be pretty cool is finding out how this stuff works. Cause here's, here's how I think this works without having really looked in the code. Um, so suppose you start a server on uh, bound to address like 127001. And then you get a request to that server. Well, actually, yeah, like I said, this is my assumption. Assumption, the server itself checks that the address, or I guess like requires that the address be 127001. And, and so I don't know if this is true. I don't know if it's the server doing this. I don't know if it's the operating system doing this. Like, do the packets even make it to the server? Or by binding on the address, is it something that, that the server has to do? So Node also has this concept. No, it doesn't have this concept, though. HTTP server has this concept, right? I think this has the concept of a bind address, and we can kind of just see what they do and where they pass this. Yeah, A, address to use. Okay, let's go take a look at this. Have you ever experimented with an e-ink tablet for diagramming? I haven't. I generally don't diagram things. So I think getting a specific tablet or kind of networking it so that I can share it on stream is just not something I've really considered, I guess. Like even if I have a pencil and paper in front of me, I usually just go to typing something out. Have you ever tried to use Vim or NeoVim? I think it'd be very fast with a keyboard and custom mappings. Yeah, I have. I I still use it occasionally even with this keyboard, but it's usually when I'm SSH'd into some machine and I want to take a look at something. And I, I've kind of said it this way. I'm not bad with Vim, but I'm certainly not great. And this keyboard kind of messed a lot of stuff up because normally you have J and K right next to each other, but mine are at entirely different columns here or entirely different rows. So it's not as easy as it would be on kind of regular accordion keyboard where you have them all right here. All depends on the applications network stack implementation. Some listen on interfaces, some listen on addresses, some listen on specified addresses or on a specified interface. Yeah, my keyboard layout is Colmac DH. Okay, well, we can take a look through here and figure out at least what some of these do. Because I can always, I, I don't need this to be perfect, I guess, for the... The video I make, I just want to make sure I've got enough to give people some information. And I'd like for it to not be wrong, of course. All right, options dot address, I would say. 
And I don't see that here, but it might not be here. Opt. Is address one of these things? It's not. What is the, it's just dash A, right? Yeah, it's dash A. So we got to figure out where that goes. Um, let's just pull the whole, the whole repo. Temp get clone this HTTP server RG dash A. Requires at least one pattern actually to search. Does it not like, yeah, there we go. All right, well, we should put a slash B right there and then a slash B there. That did not find anything. Okay, so then what they probably do is it, that also didn't work. Oh, wait, no, because I have a slash there. Yeah, this will find just the letter A where they probably check for, okay, argv.a, that one right there, bin HTTP server. Okay, let's go look that up. Would I recommend to someone else to switch keyboard layouts? Uh... I don't know. You know, I wanted to try the experiment for myself. I think there are cases where learning a new keyboard layout will help. So for example, if you don't touch type, learning a new layout may be helpful. If you're try if you have have pain learning a new layout may be helpful. But for speed reasons, I don't really think it's that helpful. One of the things that other layouts try to do is reduce, what is it called? Like same finger bigrams. So what's a good example of this? QWERTY same finger bigrams. I want to give you an example. Eh, anyway, let's just look at a QWERTY keyboard. It's just any two characters you type with the exact same finger. So um, let's say you're typing, um, I don't know, the, the name Fred, right? You press F with your pointer finger and you press R with your pointer finger. And so that is not typically the fastest thing you could be doing. You typically want to use two different fingers for something. And so a, a, a layout like Colmac tries to minimize that for the English language. It doesn't do it for every language. So if you don't speak English, then it probably it might not have done anything for you. Apple mouse. I'm using a, I think I've got the command for this. I'm using a Logitech mouse. If you're more comfortable, no, no pain in some layout, then you'll be faster in the long term. What are you saying exactly? Are you saying that you should switch or you shouldn't switch? Is it one second? Okay. I guess what I was trying to say is I don't necessarily think switching layouts away from QWERTY would make you faster on its own. Like, I think I've been slower than when I was on QWERTY and I don't know how long to wait to decide that I'm just kind of definitely slower or am I still getting faster? And so I started learning Cole Mac in June of last year. And I've got a lot of those stats publicly available. Uh, if you go to this spreadsheet, I'll paste this into both chats. Uh, you can see that when I started, I was at like 13 words per minute. And this is with just testing this thing. Not that it matters because I mean, I didn't stay at 13 words per minute for very long. And then as I kept doing tests, more and more tests and trying different things, and it eventually went up. And that was for like a month and a half. Then I started switching to different kinds of testing. And my words per minute kind of dropped for a bit. And so I tested on quotes for a while. And I think it's probably gone up since then too. If you experience pain in like QWERTY, that'll slow you down productivity wise. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I don't even think productivity is what you should think about if you have pain. I think getting rid of the pain is what you should think about. And so switching layouts could help with that. Okay. So I opened up HTTP server and we have the dash A option here. And somewhere this is used in here. Argv... dot a this protocol host object keys so if it's this and the host is not zero 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 
otherwise go through each interface and if it's ipv4 just log stuff so this is just gonna log. okay so where does interfaces come from os on network interfaces and this is something that that node does node.js network interfaces i know i typed that wrong that doesn't matter did I get a QWERTY reference? Uh, kind of, yeah, but the reference, I, I talked about all this in the video that I did. Let me link it, because th there's a lot more that goes into this, I feel. What was it, learning curve, I think? Why does that not show up? Did I not call it the learning curve? Yeah, I did. Well, how it feels learning something new? Because I changed. I've mostly just considered switching for better efficiency. Yeah, and I just I just can't necessarily say that's what I've seen. And if it is going to lead to me being more efficient, it will take it will have taken longer than a year. Did I eventually make a note? Yeah, I did. I I got a I haven't finished the YouTube bot part of things. Um so anyway, QWERTY reference, the short answer is I had one, but it was for kind of a stupid reference. Like imagine if you did a typing test, which was literally just the word cat a bunch of times. Like you could get to the point where you're probably typing at 200 words per minute, but it, it's, it doesn't, who cares? Like <laughs> you're never just typing the word cat a bunch of times. That's, that's the short story. That's what I think about my QWERTY typing test that I did. It just wasn't indicative of how I type. Network interfaces. Okay. Returns an object containing network interfaces that have been assigned a network address. Each key on the return object identifies a network request or an interface. Um, associated values and array of objects that describe and assign them. So what is this return? I wonder what it returns for me. All right, let's do this. Node OS dot network interfaces. Give me a sec. I'm just looking at this off screen. Well, there are a lot of them. <laughs> Is there a I have what two four six eight nine hey, MPV <laughs> and hey oxygen all right this is not good because <laughs> I don't know I don't know exactly what I'm doing with this I suppose I guess this always has to be a network interface on your machine that you specify. In fact, what happens if we didn't do that? What if I just went into any folder, uh, or test regex, and we just did HTTP server dot slash dash a, and I specify an address I don't have, it fails. Yeah, so this has to be a network interface on your machine. Okay, what am I trying to accomplish? It's in the today command right now. I'm just trying to figure out kind of more about bind addresses and how they work and, and trying to understand it so I can make a video on it. Zanis is revealing their birthday. Happy belated birthday, Zanis. <laughs> I'm going to add this to the list. Oh, wait, I can't, I can't easily do that there, can I? No, I can't. All right, time to do so from, from my phone. Wait for it. Xanis birthday yesterday. Done. Happy birthday for yesterday. Okay, interesting. So this has to come from here. Now, what fails when you don't do this? Node net listening cluster. So we should go take a look at that. Node.js net listening cluster. This. Or really any listen, right? Yeah, there's server.listen. There are a bunch of options. There's a host right there. Host string. Server will accept connections on the unspecified IPv6 address or unspecified IPv4 address. That's not super helpful. Oh, cool. It's on Hello. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm glad too that, you know, people are finding this stuff and tuning in. Um, what I do while I live stream is it's been all over the place lately and it's going to continue to be all over the place for a little while. And then maybe I'll settle on something. Yeah. As long as you specify an interface within your local network, Node can listen on that interface. Right, 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 right. So wait a second. No, that's, that's not exactly what happens, right? Like if I do one, nine, two, one, six, eight, five, six, no, it's gotta be something that shows up in your network interfaces. All right. So let's see, uh, just by looking at node, we can see how HTTP server works. Um, HTTP server dot dash a one dot two dot three dot four will fail with this message. And let's copy paste this. Yeah. Okay. So the reason is that os.network interfaces doesn't list 1.2.3.4 for me. Your network adapter would need some local network address assigned to it before the node, before no one can listen. Yeah. Right. And so that comes from what I have in os.network interfaces, which if I were to just copy these out, we have 127.0.0.1. So that's IBV4 home. We have colon colon one IPv6 home. We have FE80 colon colon one, which is presumably something very similar to that. I guess it's just a different subnet. I'm not sure. Then we have a bunch of other stuff. Like I have 192.168.077. That's my local network address. I should be able to use that. Yeah. That works. A link scope address. Okay, I can't actually even listen on that though. Well, I don't even know what that means though. Link scope address. Link local address. Unicast network address that is valid only for communication within the subnetwork the host is connected to. Scope link. Did I see that when I? Oh yeah, there are, there's a scope ID one for this. Interesting. What is this address? Okay. So anything with a scope, I guess I can't use. That at least seems to be the case. Okay. Yeah, wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. What is this? What is this? Interface scope global versus link usable. Routing table entries have an attribute scope. So is this something IPA shows? Oh, IP isn't a thing that you can do on Mac. That's Linux if config, I guess. Scope IDs. Okay, I think this is showing me pretty much all the same general stuff. Hmm. Need to specify the scope ID? Whoops. And then it, then it would work. Let me try that. L O zero. So I do this. Whoa. <laughs> okay. I don't know what this is. <clears throat> yeah.
Won't all these programs eventually call some OS API? Yeah, 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 they should. Yeah. Local link addresses are automatically generated. Okay, so this is this is an IPv6 thing. By the way, thank you, Inspector Diameter. I'm going to give you a point. Um, all right. Uh, it it does list. Let me see if I can take this. It does list these, for example. So to listen on a link scoped address, you need to specify what the interface the scope ID, scope ID. Okay, so if we were to just do this, we get an error. Yeah. E.g. listening on FE80 colon colon one will give an error, but FE80 colon colon 1% LO0 will successfully start the server. I'm really glad I'm doing this on stream because this is the kind of stuff where I wanted to at least compile this knowledge somewhere and I wasn't certain I'd be able to figure it all out on my own. So I want to learn a little bit more about uh, what all of this is, I guess. Because this is not something I've done a lot about before. So where are these, hang on a second. Okay, so here's what I have. A, W, D, L, 0, N, 0, N, 1, L, L, W, 0, L, O, 0. What are these things? <laughs> 2 and 3. Like, what are those? Is there significance to this? Because I've seen things like F0 before, and I always took that to mean Ethernet, which maybe that isn't that isn't the thing. Monadic Vine, thanks for subbing. Aren't those the interfaces? Uh, yeah, but but what is what creates these things right up into the number? Like, does LO have some meaning to it? The name depends on your driver. Oh, tunnel interface and everything? Network interface names, L O A W D L U T O N. Oh, L O is for local host. L O. <laughs> oh, neat. They're all listed here. L O is loop back. N at one point was Ethernet, is now Wi Fi. N1 and 2. I guess there's a EN1 and EN2. Um, FW Firewire. A tunnel. Apple Wireless Direct Link. Interesting. Okay, cool. Yeah. Am I on BSD? I'm just on Mac OS. Interesting. I wonder if I should talk about this even in the video. So the network interfaces that print out all have some number or are well i'll just say i'll have names eg yeah i wonder how you make something a list in obsidian without um without having to do this i guess i just don't have a hockey for it okay that's fine Okay, so now I'll just say these all do have meaning. These all do have a meaning. E.g. LO is typically for loopback. And that's what I saw for that. So it's where you find 127.0.0.1 and um, colon colon 1. 
let's see, AWDL is for Apple, what, wireless direct link or something like that? Wireless direct link. And what is U-ton for? These are ton slash tap interfaces used by third-party network applications to offer interfaces that support full use of macOS networking stack. Many VPNs add this. So Cloudflare is probably doing this then? Cloudflare, U-ton? Uh, tap is used by products like OpenVPN. Because I, I had tunnels here. I wonder how we figure this out. <laughs> <It's good. laughs> He's being searched because the features. I think, let's see if this works. We're going to see, will the bot actually respond to this? It takes up to 10 seconds because of the YouTube API. And I don't even know that it has a command, so it might not actually ever work. That doesn't look like it's gonna work. Oh no, it worked. Nice. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's just it's just I've gotten a lot of Bing rewards over the years. Just paid for a lot of things. Hey funky monkey. <laughs> so I wonder how to figure out exactly where this came from or what's listening on it. Cause I have four of these. I have four of these. Could they be attached to VMs? That is entirely possible, yes. As of yesterday, I installed something called UTM so that I could get uh, Windows working on this. Is this started? It shouldn't be. No, it stopped. Okay, good. Uh, that is possible. Is a virtual interface that is backed by a physical interface. Uh... Well, let's, let's look at this. Any kind of software interface to networking hardware. For instance, if you have two network cards in your computer, you can control and configure each network interface associated with them individually. Okay, I mean, I think this might be worth putting here. So I guess, like, I'm picturing this almost like an essay. How would you build all of this information up? And if you were watching a YouTube video, what would you be concerned with? So you might be concerned with like, hey, I've seen that thing about bind addresses before. And yeah, I've specified 0000. Like, why am I doing that? What does it do? Why should I do it? And I wonder if I should start with, well, here's what a network interface is. You know, you have some physical networking software, typically what you plug an Ethernet port into or how you get Wi-Fi on your computer. And your software needs to be able to handle that. That's where network interface comes in. Network interfaces have addresses and a scope or potentially a scope. And, you know, if I built it up like that, or is all that superfluous and I should just cover like, look, here's what we're doing when we do this. So basics, a network interface is any, is a software interface to networking hardware. Say software interface to networking hardware. Okay. Am I on one of the M1 or M2 chips? Yeah, I'm on the M2 Ultra, I think it's called. I've got the specs command, which talks about more. Also, something I never really, oh yeah, this, oh boy. This link won't even work, right? Because we already hit the 200 character limit. God, how limiting. No, this is 147. Oh, maybe it won't work because it just doesn't show the whole link. No, it resolves. Okay, that's fine. Without really covering the physical layer and just kind of mentioning the physical connections because it can also get in depth with Ethernet, fiber, Wi-Fi, etc. Yeah, well, and it makes me wonder, what do I want to do with this video? Interfaces are network communication points for your computer. Each interface is associated with a physical or virtual networking device. Okay, I guess I should say that. The hardware could be virtual. 
like, don't call it that. <laughs> Typically, your server will have one configurable interface for each Ethernet or wireless internet card you have. In addition, it'll define a network interface called a loopback or local host interface. This is used as an interface to connect applications and processes on a single computer to other applications and processes. You can see this reference as the LO interface. Many times, administrators configure one interface to service traffic to the internet and another for a LAN or private network. In data centers with private networking enabled, your VPS will have two interfaces. At the zero, will be configured to handle traffic on the internet. At the one, will operate on the private network. It's going to be hard to cover things really in detail because you sound like you're wanting to cover a lot of deep topics in this OS, network stack, networking, individual application implementations. Yeah. And for right now, we're kind of just, just searching through the knowledge. But um, at some point, yeah, I'll narrow this down to what I want to talk about. And by the way, if it turns out to be like, okay, this is, I just, I'm not going to do any justice by making a video like this, then we'll just scrap it. But I'd like to do something here because I feel like over the course of my career, and I wrote this down in that other note that I had. This has bitten me the most times out of everything. And I know that this exists and is a thing. And and still, I end up searching everything else before realizing, oh, this is the problem. I thought the original idea is why is 0000 instead of 127.001. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it was. And so how deep into that do I want to go? Alphonse, thanks for resubbing. Good to see you. Okay, so if I wanted to do, I guess let's keep all of the video stuff, video notes in here. So I think I would want to cover a sample scenario that people might have had. E.g. you start a service and then can't access it from somewhere you expect to be able to access it. It could mean any number of things. The application itself has a problem. The firewall is blocking it. The two devices aren't even networked together or you didn't bind on the right address. I mean, is there anything else I could think of here? Maybe, maybe some other issue, like you have the wrong credentials or something or some, yeah, some other, uh, like obvious issue. E.g. you have the wrong credentials. I mean, this sort of fits into the application having a problem. In my mind, it's like, look, there's a whole set of things that has nothing to do with networking. Like you have a bug in your code or you didn't have the wrong, or you didn't have the right credentials. Yeah, I'll just write or you have the wrong credentials. Address already in use. That would be, yeah, that, I, I guess that's possible, but I sort of see that as an application problem. Like if the address is already in use, then the application isn't even listening. Yeah. Could be that the address was already in use. Okay. I wonder, is this pretty much just the content I wanted to make? <laughs> Am I talking about tunneling on line seven? Uh, yeah, SSH tunneling, yeah. Um, I think this whole not sure why local host doesn't work. I think this was that, uh, this was some some Docker thing I think I was testing. Oh, I should take a break pretty soon. Yeah. Okay, well, let's see where I left off with this. For one, first, I wanted to just turn these into uh, having back ticks around them. Okay, and two. This should link to 
this copy and ref. There we go. Docker local host is different from host local host. Yeah, I think that's another thing I wanted to talk about here. Docker local host is different from host local host. And I think this video is going to get, uh, I don't know. It's either going to get out of control with technical depth, or I'm going to say something wrong, or I'm going to cover something at a very surfacey level. So I need to narrow down how I want to go through this. So I guess we'll say this where I left off, figure out what I actually want to cover in the video. And if it makes sense to do one on this topic. All right, I will be back. I'm going to take my break. So is it jump time? It's jump time. Hey, everybody. 15 players. Let's look at the stats. BioAim, first first place win. Nice. Dutchy, first second place win. Casey, multiple third place wins. Good job, everybody. Close the game. Uh-oh, it's not responding. Close the game. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Just need to get angrier and angrier. All right, so what do I actually want to cover? I think what I want to cover is maybe... Maybe from the practical point of view here, maybe cover the practical point of view 
about this issue and how to fix it. But I mean, how to fix it is like just always buying a zero, 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 zero. <laughs> hey, Relio. I'm I'm so torn because I think there's something to share here and I think that maybe eventually I could do it but I think it's going to be a lot of work to get to the point where I could do a video on this make it into a short just just three words <laughs> always use this done how's it feel right on QWERTY for you now can you switch okay yeah it's not too bad I have not switched on this keyboard so this keyboard once it became Colmac was always Colmac so I have to use a different keyboard entirely. And when you're on a different keyboard, it usually kind of gets you in the mindset of like, this is a QWERTY keyboard. However, there are still times where I, I just, now my left ring finger is the R key. And sometimes I'll be typing a word with an R in it, but on QWERTY, that's an S. So like, you still make these weird little mistakes every once, once in a while. Worth mentioning that binding to ports less than 1024 requires elevated privileges. Well, this was supposed to just be about the address and not the port. The port shouldn't really factor into what I wanted to do here. I know that it factors into networking. <laughs> it's very important in networking. It's just, it, it wouldn't have been for this video. What do I use on my Chromebook? I use QWERTY everywhere other than on this keyboard. So on my phone, on my Chromebook, on the gaming keyboard that I use, even when I'm connected to this computer, it's just this keyboard that uses Colmac. I don't know. I don't know if I want to do a video on this. Yeah. Yeah, note to listen on link scoped address. On a link scoped address, you need to specify scope ID. Yeah, we'll just do it this way. Okay, so I think at, at a high level, at a high level, a bind address is the address that you tell a service to listen on if network traffic, well, it's really address slash interface. Network traffic comes in through a different address slash interface, it will be rejected. I think you just need to cover the average programmer, someone relatively new to networking, what they should know. Give mostly surface in some depth, then point to other resources. But like, I guess, is there a reason to do that? I don't know. I'm just kind of torn on this whole thing. Like if I search bind address on YouTube, how long is this video? 150. I mean, this is for like, how do you set it here? I wonder if they talk about the background. Hey, my video shows up. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, I'm having second thoughts about this. <laughs> It won't be rejected, it just gets no response. Uh, yeah, I suppose you're right there. Uh, if number traffic comes to the different address, it won't. I, I guess I should say it won't. Uh, you Yeah, you won't get a response from network traffic via a different Address or interface, yeah, about that will be ignored. Man, I feel bad about this. Like, part of me doesn't want this to go to waste and wants to do a video on this. And then part of me thinks, like, what's the point? What does this serve as? 
if I can't authoritatively answer all my own questions, I'd want to get those answers first. And I wonder what kind of rabbit hole we'd be going down to do something at a surface level. So for example, let's say you want to say like, Ido, getting started with sprites. And you know, you can get started by just like, just drag an image onto the editor, right? Uh, but the way I'm going about this is I'm like, I better learn how to make a full game so I can talk about how sprites work. And that's, that's where I'm kind of like, is this, is this worthwhile? Like the servers that can listen on a socket that was already bound before it starts. Is that a frequent scenario you have? Because I don't think I often have that scenario. But then again, I'm also not doing anything like super advanced when it comes to networking. Yeah, all right, well, I'll write this down too. Uh, let me just go find that note. Can I show this on screen? I probably can't. <laughs> we'll see if I can. All right, so we're going to go see if we can find this. Notes, private, video. Yeah, so if I open this up. Yeah, this got the most votes. I'll put my other, let me just combine this in here so reasons why I'm not going to pursue this video yet uh, give me a sec okay one is I still have questions and I know I could answer these and I know people will probably kind of answer this for me but um what is responsible for sending traffic on a particular interface to the application? Is the app ignoring it? App or the OS ignoring it? And I'm not totally sure what I want to cover here. Do I want to go into depth about the networking interfaces? So torn. I should probably just do this anyway. System DNS 6 are leaning into it. Yeah, I, th I suppose for something operating system level that it would probably help. Is this level of detail worthwhile? I think that's part of it. I think another part is like, just what do I want to make? Because to some extent, I feel like you should either do something because you know your audience wants it or you should do something because you want it. But if neither your audience nor you want it, you definitely shouldn't do it. And so this was one of those cases of like, I kind of want to do it <laughs> and I didn't care too much about what the audience thinks, but I still want there to be some value. And now I'm kind of going back on that. I'm not even sure I want to do it anymore. Person who made short videos in Unreal explaining simple concepts using really basic game setup. It was Unity, but it was one of the most useful channels I've used at the time. Yeah, and maybe this could help people too, this video I was planning on doing. And maybe it would just be kind of noise. At this point in understanding, I suggest you make it on the specific issue you had and how to resolve it. I don't know if that'd be worth a video. Yeah, I don't, I, I think we'll just move on from this. Yeah. If you want it and it doesn't get any traction, is it worthwhile? I think it still can be. Yeah. I think there's some merit to just kind of creating things and putting it out there in the world. Uh, but in this case, I think we're not going to do that. <laughs> So I'm going to copy paste all this stuff back into reasons why I'm not making this video. Not totally sure what I want to cover here. I don't want to go into depth on network interfaces. Is it that important to tell people just to use zero, 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 zero if they're having a problem? Now, okay, here's, here's what might be an interesting video is it's just covering the debugging process when your app can't listen on an interface. Yeah, like I start the video 
with the issue I had. Then I ask, what would you do here to solve this? And then I run through all of the possible examples, or all the possible solutions. In fact, what if I what if I went a layer deeper? What if I added all problems? So an app issue, a, a lack of connection, a wrong bind address. And then I was like, okay, we're gonna fix all of these now. That could be that could be interesting. Can you link a diameter? Can you search Stack Overflow by views and then put the answers into a video format? Uh, yeah, I yeah, I think I could. Is this like super long? Yeah, this is super long. Unless you're just talking about this one section. And to link to the page, not the section. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is quite a lot. So I mean, I'm sure this is helpful. And I think if you use it as a even a reference is probably good, but I will probably not add this to my list to read through. <laughs> yeah, I think if I were to do a video, I think I think this would be where the interest is. And who knows, maybe I end up doing something like that. So I think Yeah. Interesting video out of this B2 make an app slash environment that has a problem or many problems. And then cover how I would investigate each one. Yeah, at that point, well, if there are many problems, then it would only touch on bind addresses, which is maybe fine. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm going to close all this stuff. Did chat override your wife or did your wife agree with chat? My Oops. wife agreed with chat. And I asked her multiple times. She's like, I like the ring, okay? <laughs> she was only frustrated because I asked her many times. <laughs> Every room I walk into, I hold up six rings and I say, I'm going to take a little poll here. I want everyone to vote on a color. <laughs> All right, so I don't know, miscellanea. Uh... Spent the morning doing the retrospective and researching bind address stuff. I think I did still learn a bit about this. And I think that's good. I didn't know about the scopes and I didn't exactly know that the names all had meaning. I mean, I guess I assumed because I always thought eth was internet or ethernet, excuse me, but that's not entirely true. And even what is it? DigitalOcean said that they use F zero for internet and that's one for um private network anyway the next thing that i wanted to do is contingent upon at least one person being here so i'm gonna go ping them on discord give me a sec hey i was thinking of doing the code review that you submitted but you said you wanted to be there for it, are you free in the next 1.5 hours? So you can just respond in Twitch chat. Okay. Tackle a problem that's maybe been answered before to some degree, but the unique added value aspect is how Adam would tackle it. Yeah, and I, I think 
I think that idea, the practical, like, hey, here's a problem. How would you solve it? And I made a video like this a very long time ago, or at least sort of like this, the rate limit video. Yeah, this one. Discord invite link on Twitch seems to be expired. You're talking about just Discord GG slash Adam Learns? Because I don't think that can expire. On the profile. Where is it? Like on this page? Can I mute this? Discord, Discord. No, these are the, these are just Discord GG slash Adam Learns. Is that the link that you're getting or is there a different link that you have? It says expired for you. Maybe try again or in an incognito tab or something. Cause I don't, I don't think those links can expire. Anyway, this video is something I did a long, long time ago and it was basically, hey I okay, stop it. <laughs> it was basically talking about a bug that I encountered that was just me not understanding how X forwarded four headers work. And I ended up making an even long video on it. Um, I, I, I like this. I mean, I think this did reasonably well, actually. 4.2 thousand views. Yeah, all right. Well, anyway, I'll think about this for tomorrow then. Yeah. Yeah, and Packer, if you still can't figure it out, I'll see what I can do maybe, although I'm not sure if there is anything I can do. Maybe you could add the server through Discord itself. Uh, okay, well, anyway, so what I want to switch to now is I want to switch to the code review stuff. So for those who don't know, I have a code review form where you can submit, hey, I want Adam to look at my code. Here's a GitHub link, you know, whatever. There's some other contact information here. And I've had two submissions and I want to look through them. And so one is from Ramey. Let me go find it. And then we can see how this goes. So I'm interested in seeing how everyone who's here, whether you like this content or not, because you're going to watch me review someone else's code. It's not your code necessarily. And so maybe that's, maybe you like that idea. Maybe you don't like that idea. All right. So here is, let me see if I can access this stuff. This is 404 ing. Maybe this person shared it with a different account. Oh, that's weird. I can't even switch accounts from this page. What? What is going on? I've never seen GitHub do this before. Okay, there we go. Um, no, I can't access this. <laughs> oh, man. Raimi. <laughs> oh, man. All right, let me ping Raimi as well. I don't think I have access to this. Hey, I wanted to do the code review that you submitted, but it looks like I don't have access to your repo on either of my GitHub accounts. Okay, well, Ramey has a green status right now. Oh, there's Ramey. <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> Why is he typing to me? <laughs> yeah, give me admin access so I can wipe out all your code. Anyway, let's see, I'll read what Ramey had said. Okay, so I think I'd benefit most from a general setup review. I tend to work a lot with manager controller classes, which are singleton classes that hold data that multiple classes need access to, but don't necessarily know if this is the proper approach. That or the way I've implemented the generation of boreholes on the walls that the holds can snap to and how holds are placed would be interesting to get a look at as these two are the main components of the application. The entire project is about 250 lines of executable code, 900 lines of source code. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I didn't give you access because I wasn't sure when and even if you were going to do it. Well, now we've confirmed. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> yeah, so uh, this is me trying this segment out and seeing how it goes. And if people end up liking this, then other people can submit their code. And I think I can provide value in some way, but we'll figure out. That's fine. Give me a sec to figure out where I can add you. I think if you go into the repo settings and then go to contributors, you should find something and then just make me full owner, uh, sign away all your rights and let me profit from your code. And I think that just check those boxes and you should be good. 
also started doing code reviews on stream. <laughs> this is your full offer. Just pay me $50. And then when you're done, let me know. Um, yeah, so a long, long time ago, <laughs> so probably like 2020, I did something like this and there were only two people who signed up and it was Ramy and a buff seagull. And we managed to fix Ramy's problem. And then a buff seagull, I think there was like some issue with uh, vagueness around the repro or something like that. I don't fully remember. And then that was it. That's all we ever did. <laughs> so I don't know why that fizzled out. I think it was that I think I was on a call with these people. I think that's what the problem was. So it was hard to find people who wanted to be on the stream and who had code that they could share and then finding a time that I could schedule it. So this time around, is there a problem or is this just a subjective code review? Uh, with Ramy's code right now? No, this is just, just, it's a subjective code review. That's all. I think rather than a review, you helped me fix an issue I was struggling with and we were on a call for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess that was more like, let me fix your problems for you as a segment, as opposed to let me review your code. And I think both can be interesting. I just think it's hard to find people for kind of either segment. Sent you the invite? Okay, let me see. Okay, accept invitation. Oh, I will actually will be an owner of the repo. Well, well, well. <laughs> Hi, Adam. <laughs> okay, yeah, so let's take a look. I mean, if you want to sign up for, well, maybe, I don't know about the debugging live, but if you want to sign up for the code review thing, there is the code review command. Okay, so I'm going to update the today command. Uh, I'm going to see what I can do without hopping on a call. Adam is reviewing Ramy's code as part of the code review sign well it's part of the code review segment see where he can provide value uh if you'd like adam to look at your code sign up here copy and paste <laughs> code bros <laughs> okay creating OBJs in Blender for objects that need to be snapped to walls, holds, volumes, etc. And Unity, make sure that the, oh, this is notes to himself, I'm guessing. Okay, so let's go take a look, because I'm not going to run this code. We're just going to take a look at the, the code themselves. All right, so I don't know what meta files are. I'm assuming there's something Unity does. Yeah. Okay, so we only want the CS stuff that we have here. Okay, so this is global settings.cs, and I know I'm just jumping in here, and there are only two things that we have. Define the integer value for each layer by bit shifting one by the layer ID. Okay, right away, this strikes me as unusual that we have some magic numbers here. Uh, these should refer to layer IDs, I would say. Can I leave comments? Actually, don't know, because this is not a PR, and I don't think you can do that. Yeah, I don't know how this is going to be helpful if I can't do that. I wonder if I should. Hmm. I want to try to set up an HTML5 based web version you could run in your browser. No, I think that's okay. I kind of wanted this to just be code review and not necessarily, um, not necessarily running anything. Uh, is there a C sharp playground I can try things out in? Yeah, I wonder if we copy pasted this. Well, just this actually. Okay, so we put this class here, we get rid of this, and we get rid of, well, awake doesn't matter if it's there or not, because it's not doing anything at this point. Okay, so this should work, right? It should say hello world. Yeah. Now, can I do this? Can I say layer IDs.ui? Yes. Okay, yeah. So that's, I'm going to just write feedback. This should use the values from layer IDs. Uh, yeah.
e.g. This is going to be layer IDs.ui. Okay. You can fork it and make a PR, clone it and leave comments with to do in VS Code. Make a PR that way too. Yeah, I think that's probably the easiest. I see the name of the layer is on layer ID X, which turns into a mask if bit shifted by that layer ID. Oh, I see. So you're saying that this is this is something that if you were looking at the C sharp code, yeah, maybe doesn't make sense. But in Unity, it makes total sense. I had HTML to my LSP using Mason. I get an error. You have any experience? I have not used NeoVim before, so I can't help with that, I think. Sorry, Ritz. Uh, yeah, all right, well, let's let's do this. I should probably write myself a note on the code review stuff. However, the suggestion of just using layer IDs that value does seem smooth as well. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, all right, let's go, let's fork this. Can I make this private? Name the same. I hope this is private. Well, if it is not private, we're going to make it private. Private, yes, good. It is. Yeah. Even if it does make sense given context. I think I think there are some magic numbers that are kind of fine, but I think here's part of the issue that I have with this in particular is um, Rami might never have someone else work on this file, but if you're reading this and you see one bit shifted by five, you'd be like, what in the world is that? And that's because you haven't seen layer IDs yet. And these numbers seem odd to me, five, 10, 11, 12, 13, like why not one, two, three, four, five? And maybe there's a reason for that. I don't actually know. Uh, but yeah, this to me struck me as strange. And this is not a case where I think the magic numbers are self-explanatory. Uh, okay, so now we can go take my code and then... Yeah, so let's copy this. Temp git clone... Then virtual route setter. Okay. So now we're going to put this into where global settings is. Yeah. All right. Global settings.cs. Why did that not work? What's going on? Oh, it went into scenes. Oh, I'm stupid. Okay. Global settings. This should use the values from layer IDs. Maybe I'll just put this here for any comments that I have. Okay, yep. Cool. All right, so I think that was it with this. Um, this part, I wonder why this inherits from mono behavior. So in this particular case, I get that this is the base class that everything in Unity seems to inherit from, but this is just for settings that has a couple of enumerations. So like, is there a need for this awake function to ever exist? And when it does need to exist, could we add one later? So again, this is just, I'm going to write comments on some of this stuff. Some of it might not make sense. I might not have full information on this. I'm not sure if this needs to be a mono behavior. It seems strange that there's an awake function with no definition. No, you actually removed that earlier today. Okay, well then cool. I am actually making... Oh, this is going to wipe out the formatting that someone had, which is why I think it's good to put these notes here. Okay, let's also do a couple other things. Let me write some notes on how I want to conduct code reviews. Notes on conducting code reviews. So 
I should fork the repo. Yeah, by the way, I'm going to give you a point, Steven, for that. I should fork the repo, write all of my comments in line with Adam Learns so that they're easily searchable, even if my auto formatter changes a bunch of other code. Then produce a PR for the person. I should comment on everything, even the stuff I'm unsure about. It may still provide value. Looking for a keyboard? Yeah, check out the, I just recorded a video six days ago about the corn and everything. Okay, so back to this. So we looked at one file. <laughs> Let's go look at some other files. <laughs> so I, I just added the tree command here. So I could search for, I could search through this for the CS files. I think let's just go start by looking at base classes. In fact, let's just open up this whole thing. I'm surprised this did not pop something up saying, do you trust this code? But I guess there's no Visual Studio Code extension stuff that's showing up here. Okay, so wall object. So it can either be a hold or a volume. I don't know what a volume would be. And then editor exposed values, we have the object type. We have a preview image, the name, a GUID for each specific object, okay. And then lengths for meshes and materials should be equals. I think this should just say should be equal. Uh, mesh N gets assigned material N, yeah, okay. All right, I think it's reasonable enough. Has collision, okay. Uh, start, if GUID is GUID empty, then generate a GUID. GUID equals new GUID. Console manager instance write to log generated GUID. Interesting. Volumes are basically extensions of the wall. I see. <laughs> well, even how loud the wall is. Okay, something I'm curious about is how often does GUID.new GUID happen? Only here. Okay, I think it's fine. Um, now a GUID could be set, but why would this ever be set? So this is public and it's exposed to the editor, but that to me doesn't make sense. So I'd probably just write this here. Adam learns. Uh, I don't want to do this. Yeah, anyway, um, it seems strange that this is, oh my God, this is exposed to Unity. Why would one ever set a GUID? <laughs> Krasner. Oh, nice German. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is the rise of the corn. Okay, the other thing I find a little strange here too is we're listing that we generated a GUID. I don't think it's the generation of a GUID that's important. And I also think that if this has a name, that it should say the name that's generating this here. So Adam learns. I don't think the generation of a GUID is what's interesting. And if it is, then perhaps also add in the object name here. Unity already assigns a unique instance ID. Get instance ID. I guess technically the GUIDs wouldn't be persistent between runs either, right? Oh, you're saying you couldn't set the instance ID? I wonder if Unity has a way of doing that. Set instance ID. Yeah, because if there's no way to set it, then I, I could see the need of having a GUID there. Yeah, I was thinking of making a macro for that, yeah. The thing that I was deciding against, though, as I was thinking about this is I'm I'm reviewing C Sharp, which happens to have slash slash as a comment. But if I'm reviewing Python, I might want something else. But yeah, let's go add one really fast. All right, so coding and scripting. We'll make one that's just like 
slash slash al and replace it with Adam learns and then just write this is for code reviews. Okay, so now I should just be able to type this. Yeah, good. Okay, let's see. To prevent the place object raycaster, I'm not trying to interpret these words. To prevent the place object, oh, this is probably hyphenated. To prevent the place object raycaster from hitting the object we are currently placing, we set the layer to placing object. Use this method to apply the object's true layer based on its type or place it on the placing object layer if true is passed. Okay, so here's my understanding of this. Uh, first of all, for those wondering what all of this is about, in the Code Jam video, Raimi showed off his project. Here is a virtual route setter. So you essentially have a rock climbing wall and then you're placing holds in it. And so what I'm assuming is this place object raycaster is something that's going to raycast into the scene to figure out where you're actually placing this. And so that's what these layers have to do with. I do think this comment is perhaps slightly unclear. Should this object be placed on the placing object layer? Yeah, okay. So force placement layer. If force placement layer, then the object is this. Otherwise we figure out if it's a hold, if it's a volume, or we do this. Um, interesting. For one, I feel like all of this should just be in the same switch, which I think is possible to do, but I'm not actually sure. Sure. <laughs> this is the comment that says a bunch of question marks. Doesn't control slash do that for you? Yeah, it does. Yeah. But I guess it'd be, I, I suppose what I'm going to do is I'll make a Python one like this and I'll make another one like this. And so that should cover kind of everything. In fact, let me just go make that now. <laughs> See me <laughs> just timestamp to where I am. All right. So we'll duplicate this and we'll just change these. Whoops. These with, there we go. Okay. And I, don't, I can't think of any other common characters I would care about yet. And I could just add them when I do. Yeah, Codex, I think this is what's interesting though about seeing different styles of doing this. I think I do multiple passes over code when I'm doing a review. Oh, nice, 3D Extended. Okay, hopefully you'll be available when I'm done looking at Raimi's code, which might not happen soon. <laughs> so it might be like an hour from now. Okay, yeah, so I want to look into how C sharp switch works. Could we do this? Is there like an official C sharp documentation site? Because all of this seems like some third party thing. Yeah, this looks like it's legit. Okay. Here it is. So case guards, non-exhaustive. Okay, I don't think this is super important. At least I don't wanna focus too much on that part. <clears throat> this isn't US government approved, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to rip code apart. I'm trying to provide some value here. So yeah. Anyway, let me read this again. So to prevent the place object rate caster from hitting the object we're currently placing, we set the layer to placing object. Yeah. So it is, I do find some bits of this a little, a little unusual. So wall object dot set layer yeah i think this comment can be cleaned up to make it clearer what this function is doing 
Oh, can't do that. Holds volumes set to the default layer. Set the object and its children to the appropriate layer. Set layer recursively. Okay, get all the children in the given game object, place it on the given layer. And it, okay, there's some typos here. <laughs> I don't know if I should comment on typos. I'll just delete them, I guess. Yeah, because I guess it'll all show in the diff anyway. Um, an exception is made for boreholes, which are always placed on the boreholes layer, unless they are also forced to the placing object layer. The wall object and its children to which the player layers applied. Is this interesting? So we call set layer somewhere. Okay, the thing that I find a little confusing is this is not actually a recursive function. Unless set layer is called as part of something like this, like there's setter logic in C sharp, which I mean, I don't remember enough about this. But otherwise, it looks like this might list all descendants and not just the first children. But I'm not positive about that either. Uh, if it contains borehole and we are not in force place, placement layer, then set it to boreholes. Otherwise, set it to the object layer. This dot game object. Okay. Also interesting is that set layer doesn't set the layer at all. It's set layer recursively that sets it in this line right here, wall object dot layer equals object layer. I would probably expect expect this line to be in set layer. Since that way set layer would actually be setting a layer. <laughs> It'll loop through the children and its children. I would probably, I'd probably consider renaming this then. Consider renaming to something like set layer of descendants, something like that. Okay, finalize placing the hold by applying the wall objects material to the mesh, uh, overriding the placing material. So set materials, go through each mesh and set them back to their original ones. Where material and noise is applied to mesh and yeah. On trigger enter. Oh, thanks for the 42 month resub. Thank you for every single stream. Like, thank you for resubbing. <laughs> Thanks for being here and providing content for the code review thing eventually when I get to that. Okay, these I don't know what these are. On trigger enter, on trigger leave. Where is this stuff? Oh, this is probably Unity stuff then. Unity on trigger enter. They're protected, so they must come from mono behavior. Okay, they're collider things. Okay, so when they collide with something else. Or has collision, on trigger stay, on trigger exit. Yeah. And so what is has collision used for? nothing. Oh, but it's public. So something else could be getting this. Yeah, I see. Should I see if a hold has a collision with anything? And we keep talking about object script here. What is this? It's a wall object. This is a place object manager. Okay. Uh, override the default two string to also print out the GUID. Yeah, I guess if there's a two string that kind of updates what I had said here. Or just use the two string that you made. Okay, so that's wall object. Let's take a look at the next thing, which is floating camera controller. 
only available for about one and a half hours today. You mean from right now? Yeah, I might have to do this on Wednesday then for you. The script is expected to be placed on the main camera object. Okay, so this is a singleton that we have here. And I'm guessing we're gonna have a git instance somewhere. Oh, this is public, so there is no git instance exactly. It's it's just getting this thing. Mudkip, thanks for subbing. Welcome. Oh no, no, no problem 3D extended. I didn't tell you beforehand I was gonna be doing this. Uh I'm I don't know how long it's going to take to review Rami's code, but given the speed I'm going at now and that we've got a break in like 10 minutes, I probably will just wait till Wednesday. Whose code is this? This is Rami's in chat. I'll tag Rami. One of my questions, would this be correct for singleton? I, I think the important parts of a singleton are there's only ever one instance and almost anything can fetch this instance. And that is possible with what you have here. So yeah, I think this is probably fine. I don't know what the paradigmatic way of doing this in C sharp would be. Yeah. But I mean, I, yeah, I think this is fine. I typically would have the instance be private and then have a get instance, which is public, but I don't really think it makes too much of a difference. Each level corresponds to the number of frames that we sampled to average the camera movement, thus smoothing it out. Low smoothing, medium smoothing, high smoothing, extreme smoothing. Okay, this is public, but where is this used? Ah, here, and it's exposed. Okay, yeah, so you can change what this is. Okay, that's fine. And then move speed and rotation speed. I mean, for these sorts of things, I'd probably write suggestion, write what units these are. Is it one pixel per second? Okay. Last mouse position deltas. Okay, this is interesting because I can understand last mouse position, but these are the last deltas. So what are the deltas used for? Wait, these aren't even deltas. No, these are just the last positions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I would rename this then. Rename to last mouse positions or something. Doesn't seem like they're actually deltas. I feel bad about submitting 103 files. <laughs> it's going to get out of control pretty quickly, huh? <laughs> okay, so awake instance equals this. So if there are ever multiple, this will actually violate the property of this. Technically, I guess that should be done here. Um, consider throwing if instance is not null. Since that means there are two instances of this. Would love some of your PRs. We're only 103 files. If, if that's serious, I think there are definitely times when you need to submit PRs that are like 100 something files, especially if you're in a big company and you're making large changes to things. But otherwise, I mean, that should definitely not be the norm. It's static, so there can only ever be one. If there's a new one, it overrides. Right, right, that's what I'm saying, though. If there's a new one, it overrides the old one, but you never expect there to be two. So now you'd have no way of getting the old one. The whole point of singleton is that there's one of it, and there's no guarantee that there's only one of it here. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, moves the camera in the specified direction based on the camera's local position, local rotation. Speed of the movement is modified by the current input keys. If control is pressed, it is halved. If shift is pressed, it's doubled. The final movement is scaled by the time delta to ensure smooth and frame rate independent motion. Direction vector in which to move the camera. Okay, so we got a thing here. Multiply it by the move speed. 
and the input controller speed modifier. So this is interesting. So the input controller has a way of, <clears throat> Ooh, this is okay. All right. So there is something that I tend not to like, which is having just public member variables. And this one in particular is static as well. And part of the reason for this is if you ever want to change this, it can be hard to find all the instances. Now in this case, it's C sharp and I'm assuming the Gitter can help me find all of the references to this somehow. No, it can't. Like I can't F12 to get to this. Okay, well maybe that's something Visual Studio can fix. November, I was submitting significant architectural changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The significant architectural changes bit is fine. And so, yeah, I, this is like, if you were a new coder and you're like, oh yeah, my changes are always 200 files, I'd be like, this probably is, is wrong. <laughs> but yeah, you know what you're doing, it's totally fine. Yeah, so, okay, here are some things to consider. And maybe this is perhaps some of my biggest feedback I'm gonna give here and I'm gonna write it on this line, but it doesn't just belong on this line, is um, I would consider how to test all of this. If you refer to globals too much, it can make it harder to mock those dependencies. Uh, for as a consideration, um, perhaps you should take the input controller as a parameter to this class and fetch its speed modifier through a function. That way when testing, you can provide a mock input controller that can have its own speed modifier uh, property. Again, this is a consideration. I, I think this is one of the things that if you're going to make a production level application, I think you're going to eventually want tests for it because you're going to encounter bugs. And at some point you're going to want to make sure those bugs don't regress. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Panda coder. Yeah. I know. And the tests, wow, we cap up. Like <laughs> this is something where if this were just a hobby project, I'd say, yeah, probably not super important, but having some way of doing this, I, I think it's good to set up at some point. And the other thing too, is usually if your code is testable, then as long as you're not doing some, you know, ungodly hacks to get it to be testable, probably it will be better written as a result of it kind of being testable. Yeah. Unit testing in unity might be nuts. I don't actually know much about it. So this is, this is why I just write my thoughts here and kind of leave it. Okay. Apply the translation. So local position plus equal direction times move speed modified. Uh, times delta time. Okay. I mean, this is, this is pretty reasonable. I would probably rename this to modified move speed, <laughs> but that's totally fine. All right. Smoothly rotates the camera around its own axis based on the average mouse delta position. Okay. So when you rotate on an axis, you're rotating on one of the axes and a camera technically has three axes. So I wonder which axis this is. Oh, probably one of its axes. Oh, I see. Oh, this is probably meant to say axes. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, take the integer value of the smoothest enum to see, to set how much smoothing is applied. So if we have more than this, remove the last. Okay, that's fine. Um, if this could ever change, we might run into a problem here. And I'll just write that as a note. If can ever change at runtime, you may have an issue where you need to clear last mouse pause deltas or else there could be, well, or else you could be sampling the, I'm just gonna write the wrong data to make this easier. 
because this is probably not even a consideration. It's probably not something that can change at runtime. But who knows if this is something you end up marketing as a product to other people. Maybe there's a settings page, and in that settings page, you can change the smoothness. And at that point, you just need to make sure you'd be clearing all the last positions, or at least down to the number of samples you need to take. Uh, last mouse position deltas, add the current one. Okay, good. And if we don't have more than one, just return. Get the average delta over the last smoothness levels frames. So average the X and Y positions. Calculate the delta between the current mouse position and the average of the last frames. Get the current position. Don't we already have that somewhere? Yeah, we have it here. Okay, this should be moved up to here, and this should use cursor pause. Yep. Okay. All right, calculate the delta between the current mouse position and the average of the last frames. Good, that's a delta. Apply speed modifier. Divide by 10 years so we can use one as a public movement speed rather than 0.1. Um, okay, I'm, I'm fine with that, but this goes into the whole what are the units here. <laughs> also, this is, yeah. Okay, apply the rotation. We take the negative delta y so the camera always follows the direction the cursor is moving in. Are local Euler angles in Y, X, Z format? Hmm. Negative Y and X here. Hmm. Okay, that's a little strange to me. Yeah, you have to think about rotating around an axis. Oh, I guess I see what you're saying. When you move the mouse up or down, you're really angling. Wait, no. That... Move it up or down, you'd be angling around the... I guess around the x-axis, yeah. Yeah, 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 I see what you're saying. Okay, clear the delta of the last rotation. Clear rotation delta. Last mouse pause delta is equals new. Okay, so this this is here, and this should be called whenever we change. Oh, this is never called, or it's called from another class. Okay, here, get key up. At least the deltas. Okay, because this is click to drag to move the camera. All right. Okay, um, I'm going to continue with the input controller when I get back from my break, and we're going to just keep going through this. Uh, I want to hear when people, when I come back, I want to hear kind of what you think about this segment. If this is helpful for the people who aren't, you know, who didn't write this code, <laughs> but I'll be back in a bit. Is it jump time? It's jump time.
everybody close the game so yeah so what do people think about this segment so far because uh i've got my own thoughts um i like reviewing code i like providing value in kind of a number of different ways but i'm realizing this isn't probably too different from development in that you would need to keep a lot of context in your head for something like this <clears throat> Yeah. Okay, let's take a look at input controller next. And we already took a quick look at this. The script is expected to be placed on the main camera object. That seems like it's a copy paste thing. I wouldn't expect input controller to be on a camera. Yeah, I'm gonna write that down. It seems like a copy paste artifact. Is the input controller really on the camera? If it is, I don't think it belongs there. Imagine having a top down view and a front view. Those would both be cameras, but they Yeah, probably wouldn't handle things like deleting. I should move this out of here and just up to here. Okay. Think doing reviews could get repetitive, but overall I like it. I could always have I could have it be like one review per whatever, like three days or something or per week. Yeah. Okay, raycast length. This is the kind of thing that I don't understand what this is. Oh, how far into a scene a raycast could go. Okay, I think it's fine. I'd probably normally have a comment for that. I'm not gonna write something about that. This is another singleton thing that we have here. However, unlike the other singleton, the set here is not does not have a, an access modifier or a visibility modifier. So I don't know if it's public or private by default. It's, yeah, I think this is just the whole, I wouldn't probably have this in the camera. Doesn't really move the needle often as it's behind any urgency or reasoning. I think, I think understanding the coder app is is part of how I'll also learn some stuff by doing this though. Like I, I kind of want that to be a focus. And I think without understanding it, it's hard to know, does this make sense at a given time? But I, I see what you're saying. I just, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like it would turn into something much more mechanical for me if I were to just be looking at like, here are the practices somebody uses. I quite like it writing it's a language you program it yourself only comment minor comment it's not listen only while doing other stuff you need to be watching reading yeah yeah that's true too many singleton yeah yeah i i tend to agree with that and i wrote that comment somewhere about the testability bit and i wrote that by things being public but i think that also comes from things or no i wrote about something being global i think right i do, oh here it is Yeah, I guess I'll write or singletons too much. Okay. Yeah. You know, I, I've heard people say before, singleton is an anti-pattern. I think, look, sometimes it makes sense to use it. Sometimes you know you're cutting a corner. Sometimes maybe it doesn't make sense to use it. And I think knowing when to apply it and kind of seeing how this goes... And I think a lot of times, the only times people sometimes spot problems is with scale, either working on a code base for, you know, two plus years or having, 
having lots of users and thus more, what's it, more awareness of bugs. Yeah, with code. So a lot of people, if you're working on a project for, you know, three days and you and your friends see it, you're probably not going to find many bugs. You're not going to care too much. You could just tell your friend, oh, here's how you work around it. Maybe you never touch the code base again. And so maybe any of the maintainability issues that exist in that code base are not important because you don't maintain it. And who cares about maintainability problems if you never touch the code base again? So I think there's a whole class of issues that once you've used a code base for long enough, you're like, okay, I got to get back into the swing of things. How do I learn what I was doing? How does this work with this other thing? You know, do I need to refactor this? I think those are the kinds of things where then code practices start to matter more. And so something like a singleton, I think is, like I said, can make sense in some cases. And if you use it a lot, I think it's the kind of thing that now you expect everything to be available from every other class. And at some point, then you're like, oh, I got to test this. And you're like, well, how do I do that? And that's where it's, well, let's, okay, let's take, take the singleton out of here and turn it into a parameter, all these classes and use dependency injection. Never getting to fruition because ultimately this isn't your code, it's not your project. Not actually getting to the bottom of any reasoning. I mean, Ramy's here though in chat. Also, I, I'd argue that Ramy has probably already gotten some value out of this. And you could argue, yeah, sure, there could be more value doing something else. But uh, I don't know. This also keeps it interesting for me to figure out kind of what's going on here. Okay, multiply a speed value by this to get slow down or speed up when control and shift are pressed. Yeah, so this is, I would expect it to be an input handle. That is, yep, just sets this stuff. And now what is this? If get key up. This is interesting because uh, another way of doing this is to just set, this is every frame, right? Oh, maybe it's not. I don't know how get key input gets called. Unity get key input. This is get key. Oh, this is private. Oh, because this is called from update. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I see. Yeah. So another way of doing this is just to set speed modifier to one uh, above the code for checking left control. Since this function is called on every update anyway. Yeah. Ramy is a value vampire. <laughs> Funny concept. Okay, so we expose the active layer mask. Now this, I don't get why this would be exposed. Let's see. Get object position ray cast. Cast a ray cast from screen space into the world. Check the layer mask for boreholes and snap the hole to the hit borehole collider. To enlarge the area used for snapping, one can edit the collider size. Place a hold at the borehole position, inheriting the rotation of the wall. Uh, interesting. I'm not sure why this is exposed. Seems like it would always be one value. But maybe not. Hey, Minachi. <laughs> All right, selected wall object. Ooh, this is this is completely unused. This is completely unused. All right, and then wall object rotation Z. Or some people would say Z, but those people are wrong. If mouse is over UI. Hmm. Rotation speed. This is interesting too. What is this? Check to see if the mouse is currently hovering over UI. Pointer event data, input mouse position. Ray cast into this and make sure and see if it gets hit. Okay, so if it is, why do we do this wall object rotation Z? This would be I'm about to place an object. If it's over UI, I want to rotate its Z position, huh? Oh, because it changes in the P7 in the editor? Okay, sure. I'll just delete this. 
Yeah, interesting. I'm not sure I understand this. Yeah, we are looking at the Boulder editor code, yeah. UI graphics raycaster. Now this is public as well. I would not have this be public. Wouldn't have this be public, especially since, yeah. And then this too. Is this used outside of here at all? I wouldn't have these be public. Probably public to assign through the UI, but this one's private and is in the editor exposed values. If it isn't over UI, you can rotate. There's also a scroll component in the UI. You don't want to scroll the hold when we scroll through the UI. But I guess what I don't understand is why is the Z rotation being updated? Oh, as long as it's not over UI. Oh, I missed the, the not there. Okay. All right. Never mind. I see. So get mouse input, get key input. And if there's an object to place, then cast it and then draw it using this place object manager, which I don't think we've gotten to that yet. Have we? No, we haven't. Yeah, I'm trying to think, like if I were doing this in Godot, the way that I think this would end up working is I would say something like there's a signal and the other thing can listen to the signal. So I, I guess I'll just write this here as another consideration. Consider using an event-based system for something like this so that the input controller doesn't have to know about the place object manager. There can just be something like a, mm, I don't know, object moved on wall event. <clears throat> yeah, serialize field instead. Okay, so WASD, these are things too that in Unity or in Godot, there's some like built in, like a left command or something, Unity keyboard handling. Can you give names to things for this? Yeah, there is like a get button fire one. Okay, so I'll just consider allowing, consider doing something like this. And I don't even know if this is totally possible, but I assume it is where you specify names of keys rather than, yeah, rather than the key codes. That way the keys can be customized later. But that's not super important. Then down and up, I think that makes sense. Delete an object, sure. Get key, left control, right control. There's another thing that I'm noticing here which is, this is not formatting I'm typically used to. Um, do you use a formatter? I find that most formatters I use require curly braces or something like this. I don't think the braces themselves are that important if you know what you're doing but the use of a formatter for consistent code is good. And I think you are using one because there's almost no way you would have typed this out naturally. So yeah, yeah, single if statements don't need it. Um, in most languages, single if statements don't need it. And what that led to in a lot of other languages is people doing something like if condition, uh, statement one, statement two, and then not realizing this isn't conditional. And so that's why people are like, well, let's just always require curly braces to make it obvious. So it's up to you. I mean, that's fine. I just think using a formatter is pretty good. And like I said, you probably are using a formatter, so I don't think that's a problem. By rotation speed multiplied by the speed modifier. Now this one, this is different. This is called speed modifier. The other ones are called rotation speed. Yeah, 
You called it rotation speed in other places. I think this should be renamed. Consider renaming to rotation speed for consistency with your other classes. Okay, so if now mouse is over UI, we have another one of those tests right here. Only place the hold if mouse zero is pressed and not hovering over UI. And then rotate the camera with mouse while mouse one is held down. Clear last rotation when it's released. Okay, I mean, one of the ways we could do this, and I'm gonna write this out even though I'm not sure I, I will like what I'm about to do, but we could do this. And then here we could say, So that would let us change this code. Is that clearer? Well, I guess we could also put this comment here. <clears throat> eh, I don't know. I, I'd kind of see splitting this into two different functions entirely. So I'll just write, consider having a mouse handler for whether or not the mouse is over the UI. They could be in separate functions to make it clearer. And as long as I'm doing that, I guess let's go the one step further here. So private void handle mouse input over UI. And that's going to be this stuff. So this would go here. It's going to mess up all the formatting of this. And then this actually doesn't even need the rotation speed. Turns out rotation speed is only needed for when the mouse is not over the UI. So we could say mouse is over UI. And then what handle? Yeah. And then do something like this. Just copy paste the whole thing. Oh, wait, actually, AI probably knows what I want to do, right? Yeah, there. <laughs> Easy peasy. Okay, so now we can delete the entirety of this. And this. Okay, cool. Uh, cast a ray cast from screen space into the world. Check the layer mask for boreholes. So I think I took a look at this already. Your array if physics dot ray cast. Yeah. Less readable, splitting into different functions. I can see though that's clean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think this at least would make it like now you don't have an if statement inside these functions. Now you might have heard of something called cyclomatic complexity. So this is the summary of it. Quantitative measure of number of linearly independent paths in it. Uh, and so the way you could kind of consider this is the more conditions you have in a function, the more paths you can take through it. So for example, this one, you could call this and have nothing happen, right? This if is false, this if is false. You could have it and have one thing happen, either this or this, or you'd have both things happen. So there are really like four outputs that this function could have. If you were to wrap the entire thing in another if statement, it increases the cognitive load you have as you're looking through the function. So that's where I think generally... I think this is sort of the theory behind space-based languages like Python. You have some function like some x, y, and you say return x plus y. This code cannot work if you don't have the tab in it. So, or if you don't have spaces in it. If you were to if you were to do this, this is a syntax error. And so since you need those tabs, that means that what, then when you have an if statement, like if x is greater than five, then whatever, I don't know, return 10 or something like that. Um, now you've tabbed in twice. And so this is kind of like a proxy indicator of complexity of a function. If you ever had a line of code that was out to here, you've probably done something wrong. <laughs> you probably need to refactor that function to make it easier. And so I think this is true of any language that has curly braces too. If you have more curly braces in a function, it means you typically have more paths to that or more to at least keep in mind as you're doing this. So um, yeah, that's the consideration I'd have for this of like, hey, let's just split it into a different function, less to consider. So now mouse is over UI. Okay, yeah, we looked at that too. All right, so next we have string extension. 
this is probably like one method if I have to guess without even looking at this. Yeah, one method. <laughs> I was going to say a lot of people modify a string class to add like one or two things that they need. So find the first instance of a substring in the given string and remove it. The text containing the substring, the substring to remove, the original string minus the substring. So find it, and if it's less than zero, return the text, otherwise remove it. Uh, couldn't this call text remove regardless, or does this fail if C sharp string remove? Does it fail if it doesn't exist in there? I guess we could just check in the playground. Do I still have that open? Is this it? Yeah. All right, so hello world dot remove world run compilation error does not contain oh capitalized remove never get used to that can't convert from string to int oh position and then text to replace all okay i see i see that's what we're going got it okay never mind i take back what i was starting to get at with that That's why I use semicolons to write everything in one line. Cognitive complexity is zero. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and the whole 80 column thing I think is great except for comments. Sometimes you have links. In links, you just can't shorten, not easily at least. And then it kind of blows out your whole code scroll bar. And I think there should be maybe something a little larger than that. Um, yeah, also what Codex said about extensions, I've, I've heard this argument before, and I could see it going either way. Uh, if you have like one or two things that you put in the string class, like, eh, yeah, maybe that's fine. Maybe it makes more usable. But then you're expecting them to be there all the time, whereas with a function, you are able to import it and use it from anywhere. I, I don't know. Um, I don't see this as like a big problem or anything. Okay, global settings, I think we looked through at first. So yeah, console manager, let's go look through that next. Okay, so what is console manager? Looks like it's something that outputs text. Yeah, history message limit, console history is open. Console history. And we expose the text, the history text. Out of curiosity, what is TMP text? Text mesh pro, okay. I see, so it's a way of rendering it, I guess, directly into the game. All right, again, we have a singleton here and there are quite a lot of singletons. Write a log message to the console line displayed to the user. Note that the log supports rich text and can thus have inline styling such as color and bolding. Message display, log the message to the Unity console. The parameter is error is not actually declared here and I don't really care, but I'll write that down, I guess. Uh, is error is not documented. I've gone back and forth on whether every single parameter should be documented. And to be honest, I, I don't like it, but that's a style thing. Like message in this case, is, it's probably pretty obvious this is what's being logged. And this is not a comment on Ramey's code. It's just, there are a lot of functions that have very, very obvious parameters. And so it might be something like, you know, set speed uh, speed and, and have a comment at the top of this, say something like, you know, at param speed, whatever, something like this, the, the speed to set, I find these comments that are just, they're just not all that helpful. What I do find helpful is if you're like the speed in whatever pixels per second or something that can be helpful because then you're like, okay, well, I'm adding information that's not obvious just by looking at the code and you can kind of make it obvious. You could say something like speed in pixels per second. <laughs> And then you can just delete this entirely. And, and so this is a larger philosophy is like, how much should you comment your code? What should be in a comment? And I find it's typically things that are non-obvious about the code that you're writing. Which AI do I use? Do I have an opinion on the IP copyright, et cetera, stuff? I'm using GitHub Copilot. And I mean, I, I guess I have an opinion on the IP stuff, but 
I think you need to probably narrow down the question. So I think IP concerns around AI are muddy waters right now. Uh, let's say, uh, yeah, I, this would probably not be a short conversation. So yeah, if you have something specific, I guess I could respond to that. But otherwise, I think just broadly sharing my thoughts on it would take a lot longer. Okay, so we have right to console log here. And then we set the console text. So this is what's happening everywhere. And I just haven't been paying attention to this, I guess. Yeah. I see. Um, yeah, okay. I mean, I other than the kind of singleton stuff that we've been talking about, I think this is generally fine. Uh, loggers in particular are things that, you know, I find frustrating to pass around all over the place. But depending on how you want to log, and I think the more complex applications get, you might have like loggers within loggers, and some of them you want to have verbose, and some you don't. And anyway, those are refactorings that can all happen at some point if they need to. So I don't think this is a big problem. Uh, so if log debug, if is error, then do this stuff. Yes. Okay. Uh, there is one thing I think would be kind of cool about this, and this is just a random suggestion, but if it's an error to automatically style it like an error. Also, random suggestion. If it's true, maybe make the text red or add a, I don't know, something like this or something. Not important at all, though. OK, write a log message to the console line. Oh, yeah, we have a color here. Now, Ramey, see, this is the biggest problem in your code right here. This is impossible. You can't have color equal to color. That's just not a thing. So just delete the U everywhere. I have to do color there. It's forced. Yeah, no, sorry. No, this is the problem. Yeah, this, just delete this. Don't know what that word is. Mono behavior, same thing. Does it mean Microsoft has a claim to it? Uh, I think there are different tiers of Copilot, and I, I think there might be something where like some of your data is sent to Microsoft if you're on one tier or not. I, I don't fully know about this. Yeah. In between showing the message, an option passes the default unit. Yeah. Hey, Chris. <laughs> cauliflower. Yeah, sorry. That's what you were trying to type this whole time is cauliflower. <laughs> I found myself visiting less sites, so technical sources being used aren't getting the same traffic. So though I think there are far too many ads, small technical sites won't get that traffic. Yeah, I, I definitely think that's true. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, stop mixing Klingon in with your English. I think you'll be be good. <laughs> Append the last message log to the console of the console history to prevent excessive memory use. We clear after this many amount of entries. Uh, it's not really clearing, right? It's just, it's just making sure we only have so many of these, but I, that's kind of minor message to add to the console history. Okay. So we add this, we add text, check if the count is too high. Yeah. Ooh, this is. I guess this would work because the new lines will all be there in the right way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But then these need to stay in sync with one another, which I suppose is fine because this is all managed by the same class. These are public technically and it's kind of same deal. These probably shouldn't be public. So no one else can ever get access to them. Toggle console history opens is set active to not is open. And then console history is open is set to not that as well. Okay. That's fine. Uh, this last couple of messages, though, is wrong when it can show up to 20. <laughs> uh, the most recent, I'd probably say. Yeah. Or maybe it can only show two at once. I don't know, but the history can hold up to 20. All right. Next up, JSON Manager. File name should include the hall ID. Private read-only string. Oh, I see. So default wall object JSON file name. Wall objects have JSON, default storage path. 
Okay, hall ID equals test hall, default storage path equals this to hall ID. Yeah, now something I can already think of in the future is that the storage path, sometimes you want different things out of here. So you might want to save off a folder name or something, but you don't end up using this uh, again. It's just it's just this on its own, right? Oh no, there is a path that combine here with the file name. Now, why is that done if we have, oh, because of the hall ID, okay, got it. Anything else? We do form the file path twice here, right? Yes, this should be made into a method, I think. Extract this. Oh man, extract this into a function since it's used in multiple places. Single huge string rather than array of strings. I see, yep, 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 yep. Yeah, I, I think that's good. If that's what you have to do, that's what you have to do. It already is a method. Oh, it's just not being used. Wait, are we talking about the same thing? I don't know if we're talking about the same thing. No, no, I'm talking about I'm talking about the file path bit. Like the file path is used in two different locations. So this line of code should be in a private string or whatever you type for this string. Get, oh my god. Everything is double typing right now. I got to figure out why that's happening. These stupid pins get bent like slightly and they start double triggering. But maybe it's the soldering on the back of the keyboard that's now starting to just go. Uh, yeah, private string, get file path, something like this. And this just returns this bit. And then these two places can use it. Oh, I don't know what just happened there. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's keep going. If J is called, then serialize all the objects. Okay, so J is your save key. Okay. Um, this is interesting. So just a random thought. I don't think this is a code change you need to make, but having input handlers in multiple places means that if you ever were in a different dialogue, like let's say you're typing somewhere, you need that input to not make it to here. So typically there's like an input system where everything flows from and that way you can figure out where things need to go. I don't think this is an issue here though. That's just test code. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I don't, even if that weren't test code, I don't really think it's a problem. Seria serialize all wall objects in this scene to JSON and store it to a JSON file. Okay, so we get all wall objects exclude inactive objects and don't have a sort and serialized go through each one make a serialized thing and add it this is this is a little strange to me so we have wall objects wall objects should have a serialized function and a deserialized function that knows how to save and load because i'm guessing the opposite of this is happening somewhere when we deserialize, yeah, how is this forming a wall object? We're first forming a serializable root. And then we're placing them. Okay, so we're not even, yeah, I see. Okay, I would suggest not having this intermediate class, but maybe there's a reason for doing this. Intermediate for serializing to JSON should not be attached to an object. Yeah, I think you can specify on your wall object itself what is serializable, and I think it would make it a little bit cleaner. Consider whether you can put all of the serialization information directly into wall object. What's a nice way to make it remappable for my own curiosity? Just map into a variable somewhere. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you would you would just save them to a file. Uh, and so Unity presumably has a way to do this because there's some document I opened that has, where is it? Yeah, this, like get input button, fire one. Fire one might be the space bar for some people, but enter for some other people. And so I'm assuming Unity has a way of customizing that. And if they didn't, that's fine, because you could still just have a mapping somewhere of like, okay, fire one is space. 
yeah, multiple key options per mapping. So if the editor doesn't support that, then you can just, instead of doing a dictionary of key name to key code, you could do dictionary of key name to an array of key codes. Intermediate class is required. JSON utility used here cannot convert an array to JSON directly, but needs a container class. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, this is, that's, that's fine. Okay, so deserialize checks to see if the stored path exists. This is the kind of thing that needs to exist both when deserializing and serializing, right? Yeah. So I'd probably also refactor some of this and make sure it's in one spot, like ensure directory exists and maybe throw an error if it doesn't or create it if it doesn't. And in this case, it's not really does the directory exist? It says the file exists. And here's where we check if the file exists. Um, yeah, anyway, I don't I don't think this is super important though. Okay, so read all the text. If we got nothing, then return. Yeah. Okay, now try to get the wall object and then place them. So the important part here is that they have the same GUIDs that they originally had. So that save, load, save will produce the same save file as the first time around. Now these should not be hard coded here. These should be made into constants somewhere. Okay, set its GUID to a new GUID here. Yeah. Now what else? We don't give it the same name, do we? Because where is that? We have object name here, but then we need to use that somewhere. I see we use it in the asset path, but the asset itself doesn't know that it has that name. I'm going to write that here too. I don't think the wall object will have its object name set correctly. So saving it again may mess up, may change the JSON contents. The way I pronounce GUID is very French instead of like GUID. <laughs> some, some people say GUID, I guess. I've never been a super stickler for that stuff saying GUID, UUID, JSON, whatever. The one thing I don't like is saying this as JOT because I don't think people would know what you're talking about, but that's the official pronunciation of them. You say GUID. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. All right, now. Ramy, I was joking when I was commenting on color, but here serializable has two E's and here serializable has three E's. <laughs> so this is something I would probably change to only have two E's in it. Can you explain why you'd use a constant instead of enum values for when I load objects back in? An enumeration can be a constant. I think that's fine. I just, this does not refer to an enumeration here. So yeah, or an enum. Yeah, and I'll, I'll write that here too. Uh, rename to serializable root. Yeah. Okay, so let's continue. We're gonna we're gonna probably go a little bit faster through these other ones here. Um, and maybe what I should do is just say, hey, let me just let me put a time limit on this. I probably should. I probably should do that. Yeah, let me write that in my notes. Because I think I, probably I'll have commented on enough classes of things that are happening. Uh, I should limit the amount of time I spend on the review probably to an hour. Yeah, I think I'm going to stop there because I think I started about an hour ago at this point. 
I can start working on V2 from scratch. Okay, let me push this. So we should see a bunch of things and get status. The remote should be... Yep, good. Okay, so git commit dash am uh, perform code review. Git push. Now go to GitHub. Capillara, four years. Thank you for the subscription. Yeah, thank you, chat, for chiming in on all of this. I want to... Where did I put this? I don't know how to find the repo I just did. <laughs> where is this? What is it even called? Virtual route setter. Virtual. Does it not show here? Clear filter? There it is. Okay, so now we go make a PR. New pull request. Create pull request. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> okay, there. So there you go, Rami. You've got everything here. Uh, I'm going to just leave it. And yeah, you can look through that if you want to. I kicked you before you became it. <laughs> <clears throat> What can you do to tell the person that they need to fix a lot of it? Because yes, the code works, but it's just an unmanageable mess. Okay, so this is the difficult part of code reviews, is dealing with the person that is writing the code. So uh, I think part of it is knowing the person. Part of it is recognizing, and I mean this in the nicest possible way, that some people are fragile <laughs> and... And so you've got some sort of strategies you can use. One is maybe call out the biggest, most provable things or provably wrong things. And another is like, you know, kind of like be gentle, um, praise the good code that they have. And yeah, include reasoning for everything. I've interacted with a lot of different people on the receiving ends of code reviews, or how do I write, say that? Like I, I was the reviewer, so they were the receiving side of things. And I've had people who are just like, I'm just trying to push this code through, or I'll fix this in a follow-up change, and then they never fix it. Um, I, so I've seen all sorts of things. And it's sort of like being on, being in a position of almost no power, and yet trying to treat it like you're a god of something. So imagine if you, you know, join a club and you become an officer of that club and you start ruling with an iron fist, like no one's going to like you, right? So as a code reviewer, you have some power, but I don't think you should be wielding it very strongly. Sometimes you should recognize what is a battle worth fighting and any bugs that are introduced to the code are 100% battles worth fighting. Like if you can tell that something is wrong from their code, that is something you should prevent the code from being checked in. But if there's a typo, if there's a spelling mistake, if there's a you know, whatever, those sorts of things. It's like, yeah, you can even still comment on them. And that's where I think there's a magical word, knit, <laughs> which you can say something like, uh, there's a typo here. And for things like this, I would still include them and they might fix them, but they're not super important. Um, but yeah, I think in general, it's just, it's just recognizing that there's a person on the other end. And it can sometimes be hard to do that because you're literally looking at code when you do a code review. And even if you had the person on a chat with you, it's different from seeing their face and recognizing the impact you'd have on them. <clears throat> yeah, knit from nitpick. No, 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 no. The no phrase thing is because I'm doing this on stream and because I'm I'm not able to focus on everything I should be focusing on. If I were to do this, you know, quote unquote, the right way, I would have conducted this a little bit differently. I'd throw some caveats in there about what I'm doing. <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> Nit, just a question. Where did you go to school? <laughs> I always start with this is how I would do it or something like that. I think that's fine as long as you include the why. Because there are some things that are really just subjective. So, for example, let's say you have something like this, and I'm, I'm purposely picking a pretty easy example here, versus something like this. This is where the curly braces are. I don't care who thinks they're right or why they think they're right. This is never that important. 
it's going to be left to an auto format or almost all the time. Yes, there are minor things like here. You can copy just the curly brace if you want to in the line. It's pretty much like tabs versus spaces. There are arguments for both of them. It doesn't really matter. In the end, if you say this is how I do things and you say, here's why, oh, I like having fewer lines. OK, great. But then leave it to the other person to decide. Right. And so I'm using a very innocuous proxy example here. A, a real example would be something where it's like there are two structures of writing the same code. You know, one uses a ternary, the other doesn't. Or we split functions in this way. A lot of that is still sort of subjective. And this is where eventually if you start getting into fights, you end up with style guides and maybe code review guidelines. If you say anything in a review and don't say why, I mean, for some, it's going to be pretty obvious, right? Oh, I guess, I guess I was going to say something like, uh, this is a bug, you know, X is less than five is what this should be. Um, this is probably not always worth saying why it should be kind of obvious in some cases, but it's implied, right? So it, you should at least be able to very easily tell the reason. Same. I don't care, but the first one is the only way. <laughs> Also can point someone to documentation or an article. Always point to a design pattern that's appropriate. Yeah, I think using reference links is a good idea. I think especially if you have a style guide, referencing the style guide is good. So Google had this concept of readability reviewers. And these were people who knew the language and only reviewed that. So for example, if you were to write code that was something like this, if condition um, statement, uh, then the read re readability reviewer would come in and be like, hey, just so you know, you should be putting curly braces around this and here's why and a link directly to a thing. So it was like, we don't care about what your condition is. We don't care about what the statement is. All we care about is that did you follow the language? And some people within Google like that. Some people didn't like that. I thought it was a pretty cool way of learning the idiomatic way of doing things in certain languages because you could trust that the readability reviewers would know that stuff. But I heard complaints from other people because if you got it, you know, reviewer A will not review the code the same way that reviewer B will do. People get paid to do that. It's like a very tiny part of your job. So if you're a software engineer, then you're expected at Google to have what they call community contributions. And you might say like, I reviewed uh, whatever, like 100, 100, whatever PRs essentially. Um, and they'd be like, cool. And you know, paste a gold star to your head and that'd be it. You don't, you don't get paid more. You don't get a bonus for this. This is just expected of people. So it's not like it's someone's job to do that. It's, it's a very tiny part of someone's job. Where is this original message and why don't I see this? Oh, here it is. Just want to share. I got accepted my first job ever in programming. Nice. Congrats. I hope you like it. Auto format on save for me and never look back. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the thing I was saying about all of this stuff is this is these are these are really just examples of something that might be bigger. I guess a better one would be something like uh, in Golang error handling. Um, you know, you're supposed to do things like this pretty much everywhere, where you define an error and then you check to see right on the next line is it is it defined or is it not defined, and. Um, if you're not following this structure, you're you're almost certainly doing something wrong. And that's not something your linter might tell you about, or at least it won't automatically fix for you. So when do you split up code? When is a function too large? You know, there's been a lot of philosophies on this dating back to like clean code, whoever wrote that book, whose name I forgot, and I'm not going to keep guessing names on stream. But generally, functions should do one thing is what a lot of people say. And I think it's like, eh, you know, it shouldn't do a, too much. But sometimes you need a function that is 100 lines of code for whatever reason. And is that too long? Well, I don't know if you could have done it in 10 lines of code, then I guess it's too long. But otherwise, you know, it's hard to say there's a, a definite breaking point for it. And I think it's when functions are doing many things that you should consider splitting it up. So you could imagine a function like, I don't know. Uh, process image and imagine writing out whatever comments you'd have for this. It might be something like uh, download the image and then, um, I don't know, compress it and then like fix colors in the image and whatever else, then, then like upload to the site, something like this. This is some made up function, right? 
I've written out comments here. These comments should probably not turn into lines of code in this function. They should probably turn into method calls. They should probably just be download the image. And so now image equals download this and then compress it. Uh, so yeah, compressed image equals the compressed image thing and, and do this. Whereas you could imagine someone originally writing this as, okay, I'm just gonna put all of these lines in one thing. And then what happens is you start using variables between those lines and it becomes harder and harder to split. So this is where it's like, just think of what your function should do. And then like Codex said, think of how you would test that function. If you were to test something that is doing downloading, compressing, fixing colors and uploading it to a site, it's going to be much harder than testing a function that just downloads an image. That should be pretty easy. Testing a function that just compresses it. That should be easy. Does Google have their own GitHub like service? If you need a public facing thing, I, I don't think so, or at least nothing that's supposed to compete with Google, uh, with, uh, with GitHub. But if you're talking about an internal thing, I can only share what's already been released publicly. So. If you can find an article pointing to something, I can give you a comment on it, but otherwise I can't just start talking about stuff. Sometimes I think they mean Sweden, which is where I'm from. Well, if you have Swedish software engineers, then you have Swiss Swiss. <laughs> this is a very funny sound. <laughs> Google did have Google code. Yeah. And they got rid of all that. So many people I've worked with do functional programming. So trying to design software using object oriented programming has been a struggle. You get the concept, but real world hasn't gone well. Always turns into a ton of help with classes. I think mixing paradigms is very tough <laughs> because ideally your whole code base uses one paradigm. So yeah, trying to get object oriented code to work with non object oriented code. I think one of the sides ends up suffering a little bit. Yeah, that's more like swoo swoo swoo. <laughs> I remember, remember the raffle copter thing. Right, take care, Amy. And thanks for signing up. So, if anyone liked what I just did as that process and wants me to review their code, I do have a sign up here. For now, it's just completely open and it's free. So that might not be the case in the future. I might eventually limit it to subscribers or something. Um, and I don't have a schedule for doing this yet. It was just something I wanted to try out. I think it was good enough that we'll do another one at least. And if it seems good all the time, then, then yeah, we'll see how that goes. Ramy said, I got to hop out. But then Ramy's still typing stuff. Which is it, Ramy? Is it color or call hour? Okay, so here's what I'm thinking of for the afternoon. Is more Godot multiplayer stuff. I don't know where I left off with this, which is unfortunate. Do I have it written down somewhere? Oh boy. Search for Godot. Well, it's not there. <laughs> where did I put it? Did I put it over here? Learn about Godot multiplayer. Test making a dedicated server. Look at this. Network physics. Okay, yeah, this is everything I wanted to do. Ooh, I'm glad I have it. All right. Yeah, so the things I wanted to do are to try these out uh, and just sort of see where this takes us. This is one of those exploration kinds of things where it's like, I know that I want to know how Godot multiplayer works, but I don't have a task in mind. So in my mind, that's the sort of classic Adam Learns content. So I know we were talking earlier, I think Simon O was talking about, uh, like there's a lot of filler stuff. There's always going to be some filler stuff, <laughs> but then there's going to be this, which I think is the classic stuff. What do I think of Godot? I like it. I think it's really good. I think it's nice to have things that are good prototyping tools. And I don't think Godot is just for prototyping. I think it can also make production games, but I think it's very fast to make things. And I like that. Would you look at terrible code bases to show off what shouldn't be done? I'll look at what people submit that they own. And if it happens to be terrible, I guess I'll end up giving feedback on what can be improved. But I don't plan on just looking at code for the sake of like ripping it apart. I only plan on looking at code because people are submitting, like I said, their own code. I think that their own part is pretty important there. <coughs> Excuse me. By the way, let me show you a picture I took this morning. Um, I put a chair just to the side 
so that the cat could sit on the chair and then I closed the curtain over it. <laughs> so this is just the cat tail. <laughs> she's sitting on the chair now though. So now she's finally entered this room. Would you review objectively perfect code? Yes, of course. Yeah, by the way, I think I think if you review code and you mostly only have like nitpick level things, it means that the code was really good. Or it means that you completely missed all the bad stuff. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to get going. It's been more than three hours. So I'm going to take about a one hour break, maybe shorter, maybe longer. And then when I get back, we'll do about three hours of Godot learning. So I hope you all enjoy the stream. If you don't mind, go check out some of my YouTube videos. <laughs> I've been making one per week, and I'm going to try to stick to that schedule. And I'll see you in the afternoon. Bye, everybody.